Uh, well, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Martin Henry. I'm the ecologist with ACT Natural Resource Management. Uh, just firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm broadcasting, if you like, from the lands of the Ngunnawal people as traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting on and recognise any other people or families with connection to the lands of the ACT and region. Uh, I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contribution they make to the life of the city and the region. And I would also like to acknowledge and welcome any other Torres Strait or Aboriginal or Torres Strait Island people who may be attending today's event. This uh, webinar, this um, Environment, uh, Heritage and Water webinar with EPSDD, it forms part of the final or is, constitutes the final webinar or seminar for the project uh, protecting and connecting woodlands uh, in the ACT. Uh, this is a, a five-year project run by ACT NRM with regional land care partnerships program funding from the Australian government uh, and delivered in conjunction with our partners, Greening Australia and Malonglo Conservation Group. The project was uh, undertaken as an RLP project because the ACT contains some very important remnant areas of the listed ecological community, commonly known as box gum woodland. Uh, some of these areas are in excellent condition, ecological condition, but it ranges from those areas right through to areas that have been modified to some extent by agricultural practices, uh, including grazing. The main aim of this project was to enhance the condition and improve connectivity in remnant box gum woodland or the EPBC listed ecological community, white box, yellow box, Blakely's red gum woodland and derived native grassland in the ACT. And this uh, project included numerous activities. The main focus, one of the main focuses was revegetation. So it had quite an ambitious revegetation target of just over 400 hectares over the five years. Uh, this was primarily to, to restore canopy and mid-storey species in areas that have been previously cleared for agricultural development in rural lands in the ACT. This was often carried out in conjunction with other threat management treatments, including weed control and establishing a tube stock, which was primarily the planting method used, also required uh, livestock exclusion, either through directly through fencing to exclude um, livestock or through using the whole of paddock re rehabilitation model um, developed by Greening Australia. This um, revegetation or these activities were then also combined with an awareness raising campaign to both aimed at the, um, the wider public, but also the landholder community in the ACT. Uh, for conservation of box gum woodlands and to encourage the adoption of better land management practices in those rural properties um, to safeguard the existing um, box gum woodland remnants. It's also worth pointing out that ACT NRM operates across tenures and undertakes landscape scale conservation efforts um, in this community. So even though rural landholders were the focus, a major focus of the, the project, we also carried out revegetation on a lot of public lands um, at the same time. What we, uh, one of the significant um, uh, aspects of this project was we wanted to really maximise the ecological value uh, and undertake good plantings. And by good plantings, I mean good plantings for the target uh, fauna, which was woodland bird species. We did this using applying a set of revegetation principles and using spatial data to, to maximise the effectiveness of our plantings. We used the, we applied the, the CSIRO um, small woodland bird dispersal model to ensure that we uh, had high connectivity to our plantings by planting less than 100 metres from reserves, big remnants, um, of native vegetation as well as other plantings. And we generally tried to plant in as large a patch as possible. So uh, if we, if on rural properties we were, um, the, the landholder wanted to plant tree lines along with an existing fence line, we would insist that the, that the minimum width for those kind of plantings was at least 15 to 20 metres wide. 
to, to provide a large block of, of vegetation. We also tried to, to plant a mix of species uh, which would provide a, a, a mid-story and provide a diverse um, uh, flora which would then support more insects for, for bird species. Uh, this included acacias, Berseria spinosa, Leptospermum and Pomodera species. And even though I guess the mid-story is not a, a prominent feature of boxgum woodland, these plantings were, were really aimed at um, providing habitat for birds. Ideally, we would have planted also in um, areas that contained other natural assets like paddock trees, fallen timber, dams uh, and rocky outcrops which provide more habitat features. Of course, this is not always possible, um, but it was an aim of the, uh, the project to provide um, good ecological outcomes. And also we wish to, to link up or provide uh, connectivity to riparian areas and, and plant in gullies. This is primarily because uh, we know from, from studies that riparian areas contribute more than their area, than their, they would be expected based on the area occupied to landscape level bird diversity. But they're also vital for areas for movement of all sorts of species, not just birds. Oh, and I should say this, this, these principles were then um, have been neatly summarised in a, popular, a recent publication by David Lindemeyer, who uh, who published recently a set of, the same sort of set of principles for encouraging um, bird diversity in farmland plantings, rear vegetation plantings. Um, the sites that uh, we prioritised were based on some information that was assembled at the beginning of the project, primarily looking at where the distribution of box gum woodland was in the ACT, which is the, the green shaded area in the map on the left, and then looking at rural properties that overlaid that distribution and are prioritising those rural properties based on an uh, additional set of information, such as its proximity to other re reserves and intact um, remnant areas, uh, the fact that it was outside the reserve and offset system, the existing reserve and offset system made those also a priority for revegetation. We also prioritised some properties based on additional information like the presence of woodland bird um, information uh, indicating that it was a bird hotspot or whether it contained threatened plant or invertebrate species. As you can see, the, the yellow polygons on the map at the right show the locations of the sites uh, revegetated in this project and they're spread uh, pretty much through those uh, priority corridors in the ACT. Now I should point out that this, this revegetation project, this was five year revegetation project really built on previous 20 years of, of constant revegetation work across the ACT and region, uh, often carried out by Greening Australia. The, it's worth um, overlaying this with the existing five years, which shows uh, an even larger area of revegetation. So in total, uh, and that, that work was carried out with additional funding under the 20 Million Trees project, um, the previous RLP project carried out by ACT and RM. Uh, as well as extensive defend, uh, defence lands plantings so up in the Majura Valley. So the to in total, the amount of revegetation re carried out in the last 10 years is really quite significant. In the existing project, uh, we undertook, every time we, we had a large site that we wanted to revegetate, we undertook some baseline surveys. And these were primarily to determine if the site qualified as the EPBC listed ecological community, and if it didn't, if it was close to that, whether installing revegetation uh, overstory and midstory species would move the entire community back towards an idealised um, uh, box gum woodland, or at least provide additional habitat for, for woodland birds. So we did this through surveys to look at flora diversity, uh, the percent native ground cover, and also the existing structural elements of the woodland. And you can see some of those structural elements in that. Uh, picture on the right hand side of the image. So we looked at whether the existing canopy trees had native regeneration establishing under them, whether there was coarse woody debris, 
uh, and what shrubs were present in those in that mid-story layer. We also looked at the existing fauna on the site by undertaking bird diversity surveys in spring and autumn, and this was using the fairly standard 20 minute by two hectare survey technique uh, commonly employed by BirdLife Australia. Uh, the difficulty we have though in, in understanding what effect this revegetation will have is that the revegetation was carried out mostly in the second half of the current project. So the plants are still very, very small and unlikely to be influencing bird communities dramatically. So what we're really lacking is monitoring to document change over time. Uh, in, in essence, what the grazing control and the establishment of the woodland vegetation are likely to have on temperate woodland bird communities uh, going into the future. And these effects are likely to be positive. We know from other studies that uh, that um, revegetation is colonised by woodland birds fairly readily as part of their habitat. But uh, as I said, we don't have that uh, monitoring, so I'm going to call on some experts from elsewhere in Southeast Australia who have, do have data to document change over time. And uh, I'll first call on one of our guest speakers, Caroline Wilson, to tell us about the Birds on Farms project. I should also say that if you do have any questions for our speakers, then please uh, put them in the chat and we'll uh, try and address them at the end of both speakers if we have time. Thank you, Martin. Can you see my I, screen? I can okay. hear you. And yeah. hear me? Yep, that's good. I can hear you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Hi everyone, my name is Caroline. I work for BirdLife Australia on the Birds on Farms project. So I'm actually based in Melbourne. Um, today I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview on some recent data analysis that we did using Birds on Farms data and looking at changes over a 20 year period. Um, just firstly, just a bit of an intro on Birds on Farms. Um, farms have the potential to maintain viable populations of birds and other species, uh, especially if farms contain well-structured remnant vegetation. However, clearing of habitat, particularly due to agriculture, has resulted in decline in birds and overall biodiversity across Australia. Um, but this can be turned around. It's been shown that habitat creation, even on intensively managed farms, um, can achieve increases in plants and animals. But for restoration to be effective, it must be evidence-based and develop using sound knowledge of the ecological requirements of key species. And that's where Birds on Farms comes in. So firstly, you might be wondering why birds, um, other than being really charismatic and pretty awesome, um, birds are widely acknowledged as good indicators of ecological condition. They use a variety of habitat. They're pretty much found on every ecosystem on the planet. They're sensitive to change, including physical, chemical, and biological change. They're easy to detect, or relatively easy, and inexpensive to monitor. Uh, and therefore, the diversity and abundance of birds on rural, in rural landscapes can tell us a bit about the health of remnant vegetation and the sustainability of agricultural practices. So the Birds on Farms project actually started, it was run by Birds Australia, which is a predecessor to BirdLife. Uh, it actually started in the mid-90s. Back then there was 330 monitoring properties. So you can see here they're mostly in eastern, southeastern Australia and also southern WA. And this pretty much reflects the distribution of uh, temperate woodland habitat, given that woodland birds were the main focus of birds on farms. They've been greatly impacted by agriculture. The aims of this project are to learn more about birds and their habitat on rural properties and to better manage them and also to engage the rural community in conservation. So Birds on Farms is very much a citizen science project. Monitoring is carried out by volunteers and landholders. Back then in the 90s, analysis was carried out on this study to see a number of habitat, habitat and land use variables um, and guidelines were produced using these findings. So that's that Birds on Farms document in the middle there. You can see pictures, so some of you might recognise that. 
<clears throat> we re-established Birds on Farms in 2017. Over a break, after a break of about 20 years, we received funding again to run the project. So it says 2017 to 21, 2021 there. That's from what we are using for the analysis, but we're still continuing the project currently. The project has over 300 survey, survey properties across multiple states. Um, we hope to keep expanding this, particularly to the north, as the project gets more traction. Uh, most of the project properties, sorry, in this current project are newly established, though we have been able to re-engage some of the original properties from the 1990s, which I'll talk about shortly. The aim of this current Birds on Farms is to continue learning about woodland bird habitat in rural landscapes and retest the habitat and land use variables from the original study to see if anything has changed. So the current project uses the same survey method as the 1990s one to be comparable. Most properties have on average four two hectare survey plots and these are surveyed for 20 minutes. So using the two hectare 20 minute approach that Martin mentioned before. Each of these plots are surveyed seasonally, so four times a year by volunteers and landholders. Um, they each represent a different broad habitat type uh, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute, but in this example, there's a remnant plot, there's one around a dam, and there's two plots around water bodies where restoration has been carried out. The bird data collected by volunteers and or landholders is entered into our portal, and it's vetted through our portal as well. Our portal is called Bird Data. Um, bird watchers are generally experienced, otherwise we do train them through a mentor program alongside experienced birders in the field. Birds on farms are usually, we include a range of rural properties, so mostly working farms, but we do include smaller properties and um, properties predominantly managed for conservation as well. Also at each of the survey plots, we collect a range of habitat and land use variables. Uh, via a once-off habitat form. I'll talk about these variables in a bit more detail shortly, but these are collected and are similar and comparable to their 1990s project as well. We also collect additional variables, landscape scale variables in GIS as well. So the aims of this analysis are to determine the response of woodland birds to habitat variables and different land use and management variables using data from the current study, so from 2017 to 2021, and then also to determine changes in woodland bird communities over time, so using data from the current study and then the original study from the 1990s. So these are the properties included in the analysis that we've done. So there's 220 properties included here, which are in the blue and yellow. These are across Victoria and southern New South Wales, as this had our biggest data set at the time of the analysis. And some of the properties also included historical data from the 1990s. So from these 220 properties, over 5,000 bird, individual bird surveys were carried out from almost 900 survey plots. And the yellow dots on this map are current properties, which also were surveyed in the 1990s. And this included 87 survey plots. And as I mentioned before, from those habitat forms and also GIS, we collected a range of environmental land use and habitat variables at a local and landscape scale. So this included a range of information, including information on fire, presence of predators like cats and foxes, presence of noisy miners, grazing regimes, irrigation, presence of and age of any restoration that might have been carried out, and a range of habitat variables relating to cover and structure. We also included the broad habitat type of each survey plot. So like I mentioned before, each of those two hectare survey plots represented a, a broad habitat type. Um, and these habitats were either, could either be including water bodies, like riparian vegetation, or they may not have been as well. But we included water in an, as a standalone variable in the analysis. Um, we also collected landscape scale variables in GIS, and this included things like patch size and connectivity. So we had a large number of variables included in the analysis, so we did have to use some data reduction prior to analysis. 
Um, I don't expect everyone to read this really big table, but I just wanted to show you the different woodland bird guilds that were included in our analysis. So for the analysis, we use woodland bird guilds, which were actually identified in the original Birds on Farms project in the 90s, using the average number of species per guild and as a way to account for variations in data across space and time. So these are mostly foraging guilds and this list just includes some of the examples of each species within each one and some species are included across multiple guilds. We excluded noisy miners from the guilds as they were used as an explanatory variable in the analysis. So we use generalised linear models to analyse the data or different variations of these depending on data normality and dispersion. We use percentages to explain findings and to generate graphs and original and new data were, were compared using simple models and the percentage of change was calculated between the two survey periods, so from the 90s and then to 2017 to 21. So some results from our analysis. So for New South Wales and Victoria combined, so there's 220 survey properties that I showed before, we had a total of 269 species recorded during this period from over 5,000 surveys. We found that a range of habitat variables were significant drivers, either positive or negative, of woodland bird guilds, which I'll talk a bit more about shortly. Of the environmental variables, noisy minor presence was the main driver of woodland bird guilds, which had negatively impacted a number of guilds. And interestingly, land use and farm management variables, such as fertilizer use and time since grazing, didn't really show up as significant predictors of woodland species guilds. So of the habitat variables, mistletoe was important for a range of species and resulted in a significant increase of all woodland birds combined, small birds, ground foragers, foliage gleaners, and had the biggest influence on honey eaters, which is what this graph is showing. The stars indicate where significant changes have occurred. Uh, this wasn't too surprising. Mistletoe has been shown to be an important resource for woodland birds in a range of studies. Um, they have long flowering and fruiting times, so they are a dependable resource for birds for nectar and fruit. And even though mistletoe makes up a small proportion of the tree canopy, it actually makes up a fairly large amount of the litter on the ground, which is generally high in nutrients and it's going to benefit our ground foraging species. Another important habitat variable was the presence of hollow bearing trees. Um, and increasing trees with hollows positively influence the hollow nesting guild, which is not surprising. That's what this um, graph represents here. And increasing trees with hollows also positively influence the frugivore and large species guilds as well, which had, did have a number of hollow dependent species in them, such as lorikeets, rosellas, and cockatoos. Noisy minor presence resulted in a significant decrease of species in a number of guilds. So in this included small bird guild, ground nesting, foliage gleaning, migratory, understory, and honey eater guilds. Um, so quite a few. Uh, it's not really surprising as we know how much of influence noisy miners can have on other woodland bird species. The presence of noisy miner species could be linked to open habitat or absence of a of vegetation structure on some of the survey plots. And for broad habitat type, so the habitat type represented by each survey plot that I spoke about earlier. So the graph here is for all woodland birds combined and tested against the null, which is remnant woodland plots. We found significantly more species were recorded within house plots, which was a little bit surprising, um, but it could is likely due to the variety of farmhouse garden and ornamental plants, which can provide a fairly dependent um, food source uh, throughout the year for different species. Um, house plots also influence guilds as well, other individual guilds such as honey eaters and small birds as well. Also compared to remnant woodland, there were significantly more species within restored remnant plots, suggesting improved habitat structure through restoration was beneficial for birds. Uh, interestingly though, restoration alone, so such as planted paddocks, showed an increase in only one guild, individual guild, 
but standalone restoration did seem to improve with age, with older restoration areas of 20 to 30 years um, benefit in multiple individual guilds. Um, woodland species were lower also at paddock sites with or without trees, so you can see on this graph. Um, not surprising given the paddocks do offer less habitat compared to more structured habitat types. Um, however, I just wanted to mention the value of scattered paddock trees should, shouldn't really be discounted though because they can provide important nesting and foraging habitat and connectivity um, for some species. At a landscape scale, um, greater connectivity and increased patch size was linked to a greater number of woodland species. Um, this graph is for all woodland guilds combined. Um, the reason why the patch size range is so big is because some of the plots were part of remnant vegetation that backed onto large patches of forests or national parks. Um, for patch size, though, it makes sense. Larger patches equal more habitat. Um, they also tend to provide more of a buffer from surrounding agriculture and less pressure from edge specialists such as noisy miners. Um, increased Connectivity is also beneficial, it allows species to move through the landscape and it's important for survival and population viability. And for comparing between the two survey periods, so the mid 90s and 2017 to 21, all woodland bird guilds combined and 13 out of the 14 individual woodland bird guilds increased in numbers over time. And this included a huge increase in understory species, as you can see on this graph. And on this graph, the columns with stars equal a significant change and with NS equals non-significant. Uh, a range of habitat types were included in this data set. However, over 50% of the plots had some form of restoration works carried out. So this included plant, planted paddocks and corridors, fenced areas and um, protected remnants, so a range of different restoration techniques. So it suggests that restoration activities have benefited woodland birds over time. Uh, although it's not included in this graph, noisy miners numbers also declined over time. Uh, this is possibly also due to improved habitat structure from restoration as less open and more well structured vegetation can deter noisy miners. Uh, it might also explain this large increase in understory species. There was one species guild that didn't increase. This was the uh, aerial insectivores. Uh, it wasn't significant anyway, but this species is showing a worldwide decline. So this may need to be investigated further. And based on our findings, some of the management implications might include protecting mistletoe and host trees where possible and fencing scattered paddock trees which contain mistletoe to help improve the health of the host tree and the mistletoe. Also um, manually transplanting mistletoe trees where it is absent or scarce in a landscape can be an option and we can provide advice on this if needed. Protecting hollow bearing trees where possible. If hollow bearing trees occur as scattered paddock trees and fencing these would also benefit their health and also encourage seedlings which could eventually replace old trees once they've gone. We recommend nest boxes as a, at least as a short term solution, but this does work best if it's targeted at specific species. For improving habitat structure, we recommend protecting and fencing remnant patches where possible, especially on grazing properties. Also careful grazing regimes would be beneficial. For planting, such as infill planting or to improve understory, or establish farmhouse gardens, structural diversity is key to provide a range of resources. And to promote connectivity, we suggest connecting existing networks such as creeks and roadsides. And for planting new corridors, as Martin mentioned before, wider corridors are more likely to be used by a range of species. Um, and plant diversity and structure should also be an important feature when planting these. And lastly, for patch size, some research suggests that patches of 10 hectares or more have the greatest benefit for woodland birds than other species. But smaller patches are also important and worth protecting, especially if they're well protected, uh, well connected and um, potentially enlarged through restoration activities over time. So in summary, um, 
There are a number of variables important for birds on farms in our analysis, and this included mistletoe, tree hollows, farm gardens, remnants with restoration, increased habitat con connectivity and patch size, which all positively influenced woodland birds. Noisy minor presence had a negative impact on the number of guilds, and there were increases in most guilds over the 20 year period, which is encouraging and likely linked to restoration. And lastly, uh, for anyone that's calling in from the ACT region, we have a fairly newly, newly established Birds on Farms project in the ACT and YAS area, which focuses on bird monitoring and creating habitat plans for land holders within this region. So if you're interested in finding out more, I'd like to be involved, you can contact Margot at this email address. Um, and feel free to get in touch with me as well. The report, the report that this presentation is based on, it's not on our website, but feel free to get in touch if you'd like a copy. And we're also preparing a manuscript for publication, so keep an eye out for that. And thank you for listening, everyone. And I will answer questions at the end of the seminar. Thank you. Hi everyone, I might just jump in because I think Martin's having some technical difficulties and he seems to be offline. Um, so I'm Jamie and I'm usually the person who coordinates these on the EHW end of things. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Carolyn. That was very interesting and I'm sure we'll get some good questions in the chat for that. Um, but for now, I'll throw over to Dr. Angie Haslam to take us through the next bit of the talk. Thanks, Angie. Thank you. Um, I'll just get you to that you can see the presentation. That's great. We can see that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Angie. Um, I'm going to present today some work that myself and a whole bunch of uh, colleagues and collaborators have been involved in in Victoria that's looked at the value of revegetation plantings for birds and how this changes over time. Firstly, though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands I'm presenting from today, the Wurundjeri people, and also of the country on which this research was undertaken, the Gunditch Mara and Eastern Ma people in Victoria, Western Victoria. We're all familiar with the range of issues that land clearing for agriculture has brought about from um, widespread decline and loss of native species, um, environmental degradation and loss of ecosystem services. To address these issues, there's been lots of focus on returning vegetation to cleared agricultural landscapes. And the project Martin has talked about and also Carolyn's work is really great examples of some of this work. So revegetation is an area of um, major on-ground investment by a range of different stakeholders. And plantings can contribute to a range of different objectives from production outcomes, reversing environmental degradation, and they also have aesthetic values. Irrespective of the objective of the planting, however, all of them can have conservation value because they provide habitat for animals in otherwise cleared agricultural landscapes. Now, restoration plantings or revegetation plantings of any form provide this habitat at a range of different spatial scales. So at the level of um, individual plantings, revegetation provides resources that individuals from a range of different species can use for foraging and shelter. We don't know as much about the value of revegetation at broader landscape scales, but we do know that animals respond positively to the amount of vegetation at the landscape scale, and conservation planning often takes this broader regional perspective. So this really represents quite a gap in our understanding of the value of revegetation for conservation. Irrespective of the scale that I'm, we're talking about, whether it's local or landscape, a common feature of revegetation is that um, plantings change over time as trees and shrubs mature and develop from tube stock through to mature vegetation. The habitat resources they provide changes over time and so their value for fauna also changes. So in this study, we've looked at a number of questions relating to these broad themes. At the landscape level, we were tested whether revegetation plantings reverses the loss of species that's associated with vegetation clearing. Here we're interested in determining whether revegetation serves to return species back to agricultural landscapes or whether it simply provides more resources 
for the fewer number of species that have been able to persist in these environments. Um, and we also looked at some questions around the local level value of plantings and what improves their value for native birds. Here we were particularly interested in the relative influence of um, decisions that individual landholders or people responsible for revegetation, how much influence those decisions about the specifics of their plantings will influence the conservation value of the resultant revegetation. And at both of these scales, we looked at how this value of revegetation changes over time. So to answer these questions, we've extended a study that we undertook in 2006, 2007 in Western Victoria. This study was designed around sampling in whole landscapes. So we selected 43 landscapes, each of them were 800 hectares in size in Western Victoria around Hamilton. Now, because we were testing whether revegetation serves to reverse species decline associated with vegetation clearing, these study landscapes were selected to represent three gradients in the cover of different types of vegetation. So we had 11 landscapes that comprised native vegetation of decreasing amounts. These landscapes collectively represented a gradient of vegetation loss. 21 different landscapes included increasing amounts of restoration planting. And these collectively represented a gradient of vegetation restoration. We also had 11 landscapes that had um, increasing amounts of a mix of revegetation re and native vegetation, but I'm not going to talk about these today in this talk. So within each of these landscapes, we established 10 study sites, each of them were one hectare in size, and they were distributed across the 800 hectare area to sample the, the different types of habitat that occurred in the landscape. We sampled five different types of habitat, including native vegetation, revegetation, open agricultural areas, including scattered paddock trees and um, pasture and crop, and also wetlands and farm dams. At each of these sites, we undertook four bird surveys within a one-year period and a single habitat assessment. Then in 2019, we've gone back to 23 of the original landscapes and visited exactly the same sites and undertaken the same field protocols to survey birds 12 years later. So what this has given us is two data sets that we can then use to examine how the value of revegetation for birds has changed over time at these two scales, the landscape level and the site level. So just a very quick summary of the bird data that we collected across all landscapes in both survey periods. We recorded a total of 164 native bird species. 60 of these were woodland dependent species. Now both Martin and Caroline have referred to woodland dependent species. They're the ones I'm going to focus on in this talk because they're the ones that we're particularly hoping that revegetation is going to be returning back to the landscape. 90% of these species were recorded at one point in time in our revegetation sites. So broadly speaking, this shows that revegetation increases the richness of woodland birds by over 400% compared to open um, farmland areas. Some of the species we recorded were really common in revegetation. And some examples here include brown thornbill, superb fairy wren, red wattle bird, and New Holland honey eater. There were a handful of species that we never recorded in revegetation, but at these were pretty uncommon and rare across the study region, even in native vegetation. So they weren't widespread species. Another species that we didn't record or we um, very rarely recorded in this study was the noisy miner. So you've heard from Caroline about the negative effect they can have on woodland birds. In this study, they're not going to be affecting our results because they were almost absent from this study area. So starting with some landscape level results, this is well, what we've done here is pull all the bird observations that were made at the 12 sites per landscape and four survey periods to give an overall measure of the number of woodland bird species per landscape. And then we're comparing that um, richness of woodland birds between the two landscape types on this graph. So on the y axis is our number of woodland bird species. Dark green shows the remnant landscapes, 
and light green shows revegetation. This is data from the first survey period in 2007. So what you can see is in 2007, there were significantly more woodland bird species in our remnant landscapes. I've now added data from 2019, the second bars here, and you can see that 12 years later, the number of bird species within these two um, different types of landscapes matches. So there's been no change over time in the number of woodland bird species in the remnant landscapes. That matched our prediction because the native vegetation in these landscapes is undergoing much less change over time than the revegetation plantings in the restored landscapes, which you can see have increased by about 30% in terms of the number of woodland bird species that they are containing, which is a really good news. Doesn't quite answer our main question, which was whether increasing amounts of revegetation serves to return species back to the landscape. So what this plot here shows is the relationship between vegetation cover in the landscape and the richness of woodland birds. And I've plotted this relationship for remnant landscapes in 2007, our first survey period. Now remember this, these set of landscapes represented a gradient of vegetation loss. And you can see that with less land, native vegetation in the landscape, there's fewer woodland birds recorded. I've now added um, the relationship for our revegetation landscapes in this first survey period. And you can see that with a greater cover of restoration plantings, there's more woodland bird species being recorded in landscapes. So revegetation does return species back to the landscape, which is great news, but you can see the distance between these two lines here shows that the number of species that are being returned back to the landscape is not the same that is occurring for the same amount of vegetation in the native or remnant landscapes. So fast forward to 2019, and this is the relationship we see for both of the landscape types 12 years later. So we didn't see any difference in relationship, um, the tree cover richness relationship for remnant landscapes, but with an additional 12 years of revegetation growth, we're now seeing that the number of species returned to our restored landscapes matches the number for an equivalent cover of vegetation than it does in the remnant landscapes which is really good news. Um, it doesn't quite tell the whole story though, because while the number of species in landscapes matched in the second survey period, the composition of the bird communities that they contain differed, which is what this plot here is representing. So this is showing data for the surf burst survey period. Um, each of the little symbols on this plot represents a different landscape. The light green ones are the reveg landscapes and the dark green ones are the remnant landscapes. Um, how to interpret this is the, the distance between plots. So plots that are closer together on the graph have bird communities that are um, composed of more similar suites of species, whereas those that are further apart um, are made up of um, more different bird species in their communities. So basically the clustering of the light green dots separate from the dark green dots shows that our remnant landscapes and our reveg landscapes um, supported different bird communities in the first survey period and that these differences were um, maintained over time. So while the number of species matched by the second survey period, the composition of the bird communities in our different types of landscapes did still differ. Now we found some evidence of convergence over time in community composition, but still broad differences. So for example, the revegetation landscapes commonly, um, well, the species that were more common in revegetation landscapes were those associated with the dense shrubby understory. And this is similar to results that Caroline presented earlier in terms of the types of species showing greatest increase in reveg. In contrast, in our remnant landscapes, we more often recorded species that were associated with mature tree vegetation. So those that forage amongst bark layers and canopy vegetation or nest in tree hollows. So what these results show is that revegetation landscapes are providing complementary habitat to our remnant landscapes and that revegetation is not replicating native vegetation at this stage. So just some Key results to come from these landscape level um, 
analyses before I move on to the local level focus. Firstly, our results show that revegetation does return woodland birds to cleared farm landscapes, but this process takes time. And this means there's a level of forward planning that is beneficial when it comes to thinking about cleared uh, farm environments. And planning at larger scales allows for um, considerations like where to place plantings for maximum conservation value, such as to enhance connectivity by providing plantings along riparian corridors and that sort of thing. Secondly, all plantings contribute to the overall amount of vegetation cover in the landscape. So in this study, most of the plantings that we sampled were pretty small and they were undertaken for a range of objectives, but all of them contributed to the overall amount of vegetation in the landscape. So this really highlights that individual actions can provide benefits at larger spatial scales. Secondly, oh sorry, thirdly, revegetation um, provides resources that differ for birds than native vegetation. So it's particularly beneficial for a distinct suite of bird species that benefit from shrubby vegetation. The flip side of this, though, is that native vegetation in farm landscapes is really important to retain and protect because our results show that it cannot be quickly or easily reproduced by restoration plantings. So now I'm going to um, focus at a finer scale and look at the value of revegetation for birds at the local or the planting level. So here we're going to be using data from our one hectare survey plots that remember we had 12 per landscape and we had um, data from the two time periods again. These sites were distributed in a range of different habitat types and even within revegetation we sampled a number of different types of plantings. Just firstly a very quick comparison of the number of woodland bird species that we recorded at sites between these four different habitat types. Um, different colours are used to represent the different habitat types here. So reveg is shown in light green and native veg in dark green, and then the two sort of farmland habitats of scattered trees and paddock. The first thing to notice here is um, the fact that revegetation sites were the ones that increased most in terms of the number of species recorded at them between the two survey periods. And then just a quick sort of comparison of the, the reveg and the native vegetation compared to scattered trees and paddock supporting many more species than open farmland. So one thing we were particularly interested in at the local level in terms of the value of revegetation for birds is um, identifying which factors have the strongest influence on, on conservation value of revegetation. For example, there's a number of different factors that are directly amenable to management decisions of plantings that, that influence the value for birds, things like where the planting has been undertaken, the floristic diversity, what sort of planting it is, and, and Caroline talked about a number of these factors. She also mentioned that factors working at a broader scale can influence the value of habitat patches for animals too, so things like the cover of vegetation or the diversity of land use types in the surrounding landscape. Here we were particularly interested in which of these sorts of attributes has the strongest effect on on the woodland birds that the plantings support. What we found was that management decisions relating to four different um, attributes have, do have an effect on the woodland bird species in revegetation. Firstly, plantings um, that have a no greater number of different shrub or tree species support more, more woodland bird species. So in all of these plots, I've got a measure of woodland rich, species richness on the, the y-axis and the different predictor variable on the X. So you can see that as floristic diversity increases, so too does bird diversity. This is just really reflecting the fact that greater um, diversity in, in plant species provides a greater range of habitat resources and also structural complexity of them too. Secondly, we found that um, plantings that were located in areas with more native vegetation in the local vicinity supported more species. And here we're talking about um, cover of other vegetation within 500 metres around the revegetation site supported more species. And this is related to the fact that such sites have a greater um, amount of additional resources and habitat in close proximity that species can use in addition to those provided by the revegetation planting itself. 
Thirdly, we found that plantings that are fenced to exclude stock grazing supported more species. This is getting at the influence that disturbance to ground layers can have on habitat for birds, particularly those species that forage amongst ground and litter layers. And lastly, we found a positive effect of revegetation age, particularly in the first couple of decades post planting, the number of woodland bird species increases over time. So we've results show that um, Local management decisions do have a strong effect on the value of revegetation for birds. When it comes to attributes of the surrounding landscape, we found that the cover of native vegetation was a key influence as well. So here we're looking at two plots that show the positive relationship between birds in revegetation and the amount of vegetation now at slightly larger scales in the surrounding one kilometre and five kilometre around plantings. Really importantly, however, though, these positive relationships didn't serve to override the influence of those local scale decisions. So all of them are important in their own right. So just to finish with some key messages from these local level analyses. Firstly, is the fact that revegetation increases in value for birds over time, with particularly a rapid increase in the first one to two decades. And this really highlights the quick return on effort and investment that revegetation provides in terms of conservation outcomes. Importantly, though, we'd expect ongoing changes to continue over time for longer periods still, though. So in the second survey period, the oldest planting that we sampled was 50 years of age or just over. So by that stage, there was still a number of different habitat attributes that had yet to be developed in plantings. So ongoing change is expected. Second, local decisions about what and where to plant do have measurable impacts on the conservation value of plantings for birds. So this in, in really emphasizes the important role of local management in the value of vegetation for native species. But the um, importance of vegetation in the surrounding landscape around plantings also emphasises the importance of the collective actions of individuals and conservation organisations or um, local groups to um, the, the efforts of, of those sort of collective efforts towards enhancing the cover of vegetation at these broader scales, because by working together, there's greater capaci capacity to increase vegetation at the larger scale. So just to finish now with a very quick summary of the overall um, findings of our project. Firstly, at the level of individual plantings, results show that revegetation does have value because it provides habitat resources that are used by 90% of the woodland bird species in our study region. And collectively, revegetation uh, plantings contribute to the overall cover of vegetation in the landscape. And at the landscape scale, our results show that revegetation can serve to reverse the loss of species associated with clearing for agriculture, which is a really exciting finding. In combination, these two factors really emphasise that revegetation is an effective conservation investment um, for a couple of reasons. It's a one off cost that can be added to over time to incrementally build um, value across the landscape. Plantings improve in value for native species rapidly, but they're also expected to have long term value through ongoing changes still. Revegetation is an action that is achievable for individuals, but with collective action, there's greater capacity to transform landscapes. But despite all this, um, our results also really emphasise the, the real importance of retaining and protective native vegetation in agricultural landscapes, whether it's patches of native veg or even individual mature trees in open farmland areas. Because our results also show that while revegetation does have value for native species, um, it's not able to replicate the habitat provided by native elements um, for, for many decades. Just a quick acknowledgement of the funding bodies for this research and also a, a recognition of the many landholders that provided access to their properties over the course of two survey periods. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Uh
my apologies. I got kicked out of my own webinar by a technological snafu, something to do with wireless connectivity. So I'm back in the open plan office, uh, if you can hear some background noise. Um, so I, I guess I can't ask a particularly informed question for the bits that I missed, but uh, maybe I'd ask the, the presenters about what sort of proportion of, of agricultural landscapes do you think um, need revegetation in order to support, I guess, um, ongoing bird communities, woodland bird communities, given that it's been posited that uh, a rough figure would be about 30% of the landscape in order to retain biodiversity um, to some extent. Angie? <laughs> given you talked about landscape level effects. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the landscapes that we sampled included up to just under 20%. Um, and that was, well, it was fairly difficult to find for reveg to that level, but um, that, was, that, that was representative for the native vegetation in the region. Um, so I guess that suggests firstly that greater cover than 20% in the region we looked at is going to be hard to manage when you're talking about natural elements, um, but it was achievable for restoration. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think more is better. 20% has been also suggested as a good amount to, to maintain for, for native, native elements or dedicated to conservation. So if you've got much less than that, be looking to restore where possible, but I know you've got in some areas much higher cover in the ACT, don't you? So you're doing pretty yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, the difference between maybe the ACT and Western Victoria is the amount of remnant vegetation in the landscape. Yeah. Yeah. Which may or may not have an influence on how how um quickly that revegetation is colonized by birds. Yes, yeah, yep, that's true. Yeah. Because, yeah, even at the high end, that across the board, the landscapes were more depleted. So yeah. the capacity for colonisation, I think that, that will affect the capacity and also the time frame over which you'd observe those changes. Yeah. Uh, one question from the chat is, uh, have you looked at the influence of weed species such as briar rose, cotoneaster, privet, blackberry, which provide food resources and habitat, protected nesting environments from predators for small birds? It's a conundrum for conservation oriented landholders. Getting rid of weeds is a priority, yet deprives many birds of these useful resources. Uh, so the question directed at me yeah, yeah. or Caroline? Well, either. Do you know what either. the you know what the influence of these weed species are as substitute native um, flora as habitat. Speaking from our results, um, I, I'd actually have to go and have a look at what sort of how much weed species comprised cover of vegetation in our sites. Um, it's not something we looked at directly, but it's a really good question and a good point. Um, in terms of the the attributes that had the strongest influence on the value of reveg, it wasn't things like vegetation cover. Well, that didn't come out as strongly as just overall floristic diversity. But there, we I didn't include weed species in that measure. Yeah. I presume the, the floristic diversity is primarily as a direct and indirect food source. Mm -hmm. Is that why large floristic diversity is advantageous? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, Yes, for food resources, but also adding to structural complexity of sites. So yeah. with a greater diversity, because our sampling incorporated um, uh, small woodlots on farms, which were monocultures of canopy species. So there was uh, okay. we did sample in quite a diverse range of revegetation. So there's some effect there too related to just the, I guess, the range of diversity that's covered in terms of floristics. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure just one final point, sorry, Caroline, then I'll let you <laughs> contribute. Um, I reckon there'd be some sort of threshold level, uh, as with most things, uh, uh, maybe a small amount of this might provide uh, not too detrimental effects, but by the time you are uh, heavily in, invaded with weeds, I reckon then you're going to see a different effect. Yeah. Less, okay. more strong and negative effect. 
Uh, another question for you, Caroline. Caroline, you mentioned using a connectivity index in your analysis. Just wondering how you generated this index for different monitoring sites. Uh, so this was actually done by our analytics team. So <laughs> I didn't do it myself, but they used um, index from another study. I don't know off the top of my head what it is, but I can find no. out. But yeah, they. You, I think it might have been from one or two other studies that they generated the index from. Yeah, okay. And then apply that to our data. Uh, that's all the questions in the chat. Uh, there was a question about, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> about. Uh, the there's one more little bit higher up. Um, it, it says, do we know the cause of insectivorous bird decline? Are there links to the use and bioaccumulation of insecticides at all? Yeah, that's the one I saw too. <laughs> um, yeah, there, it's still a lot of unknowns with that sort of aerial insectivore decline. I think one of the theories is accumulated pesticide use and also climate change and habitat loss as well, which is affecting the prey for these species. But I think there's it's still fairly early days of working out exactly what it is. And there's been some recent studies that have suggested these things, but it hasn't been narrowed down to one or the other. Sorry if this is repeating information you've already given. But <laughs> is there responsible? Is there responses? Response differences between guilds in terms of the age sequence in in revegetation. So do the insectivores come in first, followed by other species, oh. or it's not that noticeable? We didn't actually go into that much detail. The it came up a little bit because we did look at the age of restoration for plots where it had been carried out. Um, most of the restoration was a maximum of 30 years old in our study and within the 20 to 30 year age category, that's where we started to see some positive influences for some of the guilds. That One of them was for bark forages, so I think that's um, I think you said, Angie, that some of the species that will come in as there, you get more mature trees in the restoration. Yeah. Um, That's right. Yeah. Um, I think it, they, that might have been the only guild that was positively influenced by that sort of age category of um, restoration. The, the younger categories didn't really show much at all. So restoration that was like less than 10 years old and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. We've done a bit of work, which I didn't present, looking at, uh, I guess, some reveg age response curves for different species uh, with the, and developing predictions about which um, life history guilds you'd expect to see coming in at, at which point in time. Um, and so there wasn't consistent patterns, I think it's fair to say, but general trends were sort of the understory associated species did um, increase, see an increase in use of revegetation sooner than canopy um, requiring species. So um, bark forages in particular um, tended to, to not occur in plantings before, you know, 30 to 40 years and definitely 50 years. But I, I haven't presented that all today. All right, I think if that's uh, all the questions and we're now over time. I think uh, I'll thank both our guest speakers and uh, so that's the end of the seminar. Great, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Martin. Martin and Caroline.